Hi guys, welcome to week eight of environmental law. This week we are going to be working on the Clean Air Act. So the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act were the big starts to our environmental law movement, right? So we've talked about NEPA, which is the statute which requires federal agencies to consider the environment before they undergo any major action. And now this is, you know, laws that apply to everyone. So to just kind of get you in the mood, um, you could pause this. I posted some, uh, a nice little song for you to uh, listen to <laughs> about the air that we breathe. I can't really put it on here because then I'll get copyright violated, but um, you can go ahead and do that. And when you're done, come back to me. Okay, so just some, you know, that's our Holly's quote. And then I just thought this was funny. Frank Baum, L. Frank Baum, the author of The Wizard of Oz. Whenever I feel blue, I start breathing again. Ha ha, you know, you're blue when you can't breathe. Okay, so why the Clean Air Act? We, you know, you guys don't know, you don't remember, you weren't, you, you weren't around, or some of you may have been around. But um, before our anti-pollution laws in the 1970s, we had terrible, terrible air qualities, especially, you know, mostly in the cities, right? There was visible air pollution, there was brown clouds, smog, dirty haze. I mean, we've all been in Chicago or in the area when like when there, there are just days where you're like, oh boy, the air quality is terrible, right? So it was like that all the time. Um, and it was like that in most of our cities and in industrial centers. And people, you know, as, as we've talked about, became more aware of the health detriments to this. And um, Congress was spurred into action. Um, so that's kind of why we have it. Clean Air Act is has been through a few permutations to clean and you know, keep up with what's going on with our clean air needs. And because of that, it's a little clunky, right? There's a lot of like, oh, this is an amendment and it's it's not very streamlined. Um, but our basic structure was enacted in 1970. Here's Richard Nixon, who was the president who signed who was signed the Clean Air Act into law. Okay, I believe that, uh, I think that 1970 will be known as the year of the beginning when we really began to move on the problems of clean air and clean water because the Clean Water Act was um, passed in 1972. So I think that NEPA was passed in 1969, effective in 1970. Okay, so before our Clean Air Act, we had some air pollution statutes, but there, were, there weren't really like requirements or teeth in them. Um, they were more about, oh, we have to research the causes of air pollution. We have to research the uh, effects on human health of air pollution or the, the effects on wildlife, things like that. So there was a lot of stuff on research. Air Quality Act of 1967 started, um, you know, limiting things you can pollute, but, um, but nothing major, nothing uniform until the Clean Air Act in 1970. And there were big amendments to the Clean Air Act in 1977, 1990, 1981. Um, so yeah, it is a patchwork of programs. It's not like a cohesive logical scheme. And um, remember when we were talking about climate change, uh, when Obama and the EPA, they did not want to regulate greenhouse gases through Clean Air Act. They just thought it would be too complicated. And you're like, we're regulating one pollutant, but then maybe we're going to be creating another pollutant. And we just, they just did not believe that the Clean Air Act was the appropriate place to regulate these greenhouse gases. Um, as you know, spoiler alert, that's what ended up happening. Um, but I guess better that than no regulation, right? Okay, so our first Clean Air Act, we they, you know came up with some findings. Um, okay, it says that urban areas cross borders between states. So think about you know we talk about Chicago land, right? In Chicago, you have Chicago or an Indiana industrial area, right? That or you have uh, that 
border crossing between states. I think of where I grew up in New York that called it the tri-state area, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, all kind of our urban areas there. Um, so that's talking about the, the fact that urban areas cross the border between states, that invokes the Interstate Commerce Clause as the power to create this cleaner act. Okay. And then next thing that they're finding, air pollution has grown is complicated and is complicated. We know it's complicated and it poses danger to, in red, public health and welfare. Okay. So remember we were talking about, okay, the federal government uses the interstate commerce clause to get power to regulate the environment, but the states use their police power, right? And the police power talks about promoting the public health and welfare, right? So those are our two powers here. Okay. Um, they do say that prevention is the primary responsibility of states and local governments. So even though the Clean Air Act is a federal statute, they're using this because it is by and large administered by the states through their own implementation plans. Um, but, you know, we're going to give federal financial uh, assistance um, and, and help. Okay. So the, the states don't have to do it on their own. Okay, here's their declaration of purpose. Okay, protect and enhance our air resources, research and development. This part where we're they're doing te technical and financial assistance to state and local governments, um, because you know we have these urban areas going over different borders. They have regional air pollution prevention programs, and you know we are trying to prevent further pollution. Okay, so here's what it does. Uh, we, the first thing that the Clean Air Act does is it sets ambient air quality standards. Um, and those are with uh, just a few, and we'll talk about them in a minute, certain criteria pollutants, right? Greenhouse gases are not in these criteria pollutants, okay? But they set, they're setting an air quality sta standard. What is the acceptable limit of these criteria pollutants in our atmosphere or in our air? Okay. And so we have these air quality standards and then the states have to test, oh, do we meet these air, uh, air quality standards? And if uh, they don't, they have to create what we call a state implementation. Well, they, they all have to do it anyway. A state implementation plan and to either achieve or maintain these NAAQs the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, right? That's your NAAQs. That's the acronym, okay? Um, for new sources of pollution, right, a new factory, a new something or other, the EPA establishes what we call new source performance standards, okay? So for things that are newer, they are going to have a um, higher level of exploitation on, you know, technology and ability to pollute less. Um Okay, and then they also set emission standards for hazardous air pollutants. Okay, so that's emissions, right? That's like cars and stuff. And, and then grants the EPA enforcement authority. How are we going to enforce it? There's, and we'll talk about that later on in the, in the class, and allows for citizen shoot, suits and it also allows EPA to control motor vehicle emissions, right? This is something you and I, we all, anybody who owns a car deals with this every year that you have to go get your emissions checked. Okay. You'll notice as we go through, and really the first time I was teaching this because I hadn't delved into the Cleaner Act since law school, there's different um, standards that are set forth in the Clean Air Act. Okay. So you might want to just think about when, when you're, when we're talking about this later, there's, there's, two ways that the EPA is going to regulate how air pollutants get in the air. Okay. One is a technology based standard. Okay. So they're saying, okay, you know, in our year, we have a certain level of technology for filtration standards or for, you know, how, how, what factories can put out there. Right. In um, five years, there might be better technology for this. 10 years ago, there is less. Okay. So, um, that is a technology standard. Okay. We're basing what, how, um, how good you have to get, right? Like when we go to, when you go to get your furnace filter, okay, there's like 
super one, super air filters, and then there's ones that are like super basic, right? So different levels of technology. How much do you want to pay uh, to filter the air into your house? So think about that, different levels. Okay, so that's your technology-based standards. The other kinds of standards are straight emission standards. How much of a pollutant can you allow into the air? Okay, and that's maybe what you think of with your car, right? How much... Um, uh, I don't know, lead, we don't have lead anymore, but you know, if, when there was lead, how much lead can be allowed into the air? Okay. So that's your emission standard. So two different types of standards and they apply in different situations. So we'll go through that, but I just want, you know, kind of have, um, an idea of that when we get, when we delve into that a little bit later. Um, okay. Other things there's, times when we have to figure out what the Clean Air, is, Air Act is talking about, what pollutants are they talking about? What pollutants are they re regulating? Um, does application of the Clean Air Act depend on whether an area has either attained or not attained existing standards, right? Are they are they good or do they have further work to go to get to, to meet the standards set by the EPA in under the Clean Air Act? Um, is it only for major sources, like, or just, you know, I don't have to, nobody's going to monitor what comes out of my chimney when I my, use my fireplace, right? Major source, sources are all sources. Um, this is a big one different standards for existing sources or new sources, right? New sources, right, are going to require a higher level of technology. Um, stationary sources, right, something that is a factory or uh, a site of some sort, um, or mobile sources like cars and trucks, boats, airplanes, um, and other sources like consumer products. So, right, so the, you know, those are just kind of things we want to think about. Okay, our technology standards, right, um, which we talked about. What, you know, we were, what's when the APA is telling us what level of equipment, equipment needs to be used to filter these emissions before it goes out into the air. Um, it depends on what type of pollutant we're talking about and the danger of that pollutant and the availability of this tech, you know, filtration technology. Okay. So if you have something that's not so dangerous, you're going to have a lower level of technology required, right? You can get that nice little cheapo air filter at the Home Depot. When you're talking about something that's a toxic type or, you know, super harmful type emission, you're going to need that highest level with super microns or whatever. Okay, and it'll apply to the whatever piece of equipment is creating the pollution. Okay, so here's our technology standards. Best. Best available control technology, BACT. Okay, so you're, you're the best degree of pollutant re reduction, but we're also considering economic, energy, and environmental factors, okay? Um, so that's a pretty high standard. Uh, generally available control technology, okay? So just kind of what, what the industry standard is. Maximum available control technology. So that goes above best, right? Highest, highest standard. What, uh, you know, we're not thinking of economic factors. What is the best that you can get? Um, and reasonably available to facilities of that type with the same type of admissions. Okay. So maybe a lower standard than GACT. So those are, you know, you might see these RACT, GACT, BACT. Um, the emission standards are those based on, you know, what's going into the air. And, you know, you, you we've noticed, right, that our car emissions Science continue, continually influences both both of these kinds of standards, right? So, you know, at some point in 1970, there was only a certain amount we could limit these emissions, right? Because people want to drive their cars. But um, 
as technologies increased and think about, you know, the, the, the hybrids and now everybody's getting these, the, all the auto manufacturers are, are working on these EVs um, for, because the technology is there. And, you know, there's a little bit of the tail wagging the dog because the, now the EPA is requiring less and less emissions and the traditional engines, the non-electric engines can't achieve that. So then they're like, well, if we want, if we want our new cars to meet the standards, they have to be EVs. So, and so if you're dealing with emission standards, it's not going to have one of those acronyms. It's just going to be a number like 0.22 particulates per, you know, something or other in the air. Um, one of the things, you know, that becomes an issue with the Clean Air Act is preemption. And we kind of, we talked about this before, right? Do these standards supersede local or state clean air standards? Okay. So in 2004, um, there was a local, a town or a township, an area, they um, passed rules saying that you can't sell these vehicles if you don't met, meet a higher emission standard, right? So higher than the EPA was putting out. Um, so the people, you know, the companies that are making these engines said that, you know, whoa, we're meeting CA Clean Air Act standards, you're preempted. Um, and the court held that, you know, because we, we kind of learned that higher standards, local standards were, were okay. Um, you just couldn't make your standards less stringent than the, um, than the EPA, but the Supreme court held that, yeah, sometimes the C clean air act preempts local rules. Um, states can't just come up with any standard, um, and emission standards can't over, you know, cannot be overridden by states. Um, so in the Clean Air Act, no, they, they kind of have to keep the standards set by the EPA. All right, so what I want to do, you do now, I'm going to stop this little one and we're going to go to our module and there's something fun. It's all the way at the end, but you can use this link to find your local air quality. So this is just for fun. Um, put in your town, your your zip code or whatever on this website. And um, yeah, you have to do it. You have to choose your state and um, you can figure out what your air quality is. All right, I'm gonna stop this one and then come back when you're done for the next video.